to another episode of Preferred Walk On, a PFF college football show. I have a very, very special guest on right now, and that is Jordan Reed, who's an NFL draft and a college football expert for ESPN. Jordan, I, I mentioned this before, man. I'm a huge, huge fan of your work, man. Thank you so much for coming on the show. No problem, Max. It's a pleasure being on here. Thanks for having me. Of course, dude. So, the, so obviously, last month, you put out a 2024 NFL mock draft. Before we get into the nitty gritty of that mock draft, I wanted to ask you, what are your, some of your like preliminary takes on this 2024 class so far? Yeah, it's been a fun class to study through the spring and the summer. I usually hit the ground running about two weeks after uh, the initial draft class. So it's once 2023 got over. Did some grades after that, some assessments, and then you hit the ground running with next year's class. It's the fun part about the draft process. There's always work to do. But this class, I think the difference between this year's class and last year's class, I think we have much more blue chip talent at the top. And, I mean, you start with guys like Caleb Williams, quarterback of USC, Drake May, North Carolina, Olu Fashanu, offensive tackle, Penn State, Brock Bowers, tight end, Georgia. You're just listing off all these different names of these players that are going to come in right away and potentially be pro bowlers. So I think that's the difference between this year's class and then what we saw at the top of last year's class. And that's not to discredit Bryce Young, CJ Stroud, or Will Anderson, but I just think there's more immediate talent that translates right away in this upcoming class. Absolutely. You mentioned that first guy you talked about right there, Caleb Williams. You got to go number one overall to the Arizona Cardinals. I wanted to ask you just how special of a quarterback prospect is this guy? Do you think, you know, when the draft rolls around, we could be putting him in the same breath as Andrew Luck and Trevor Lawrence as far as the best quarterback prospects in recent memory? Yeah, I wouldn't put him in that tier with Andrew Luck just because Andrew Luck was just a different specimen to me. But he's in that Trevor Lawrence, that Joe Burrow type of tier of where you know they're going to come in right away. We're not even going to waste any time with the quote-unquote quarterback competition with these guys. Let's just give them the reins right away. But Caleb, and I, I talked about this on NFL Live a couple of weeks ago, and that he's just smooth and special. That's the two words that I would use to describe him. Everything that he does is just effortless. Does need to take a little bit care, or better care of the football. Um, he had five interceptions uh, last year, but there were some opportunities of where uh, he could have had some turnover-worthy plays. But as far as what you want him to do, he's able to accomplish that. But what makes him so special is just his wizardry inside and outside of the pocket. He's able to uplift a lot of the talent that they had at USC. So he, he's definitely a special quarterback prospect. Yeah, absolutely. And as someone who was lucky enough to talk to him for about 20 minutes, I can tell you, he's just as special on the mic, man. That guy is a star in, in every sense of the word. But obviously, Arizona already has a sizable commitment to Kyler Murray in that contract. So I wanted to play kind of a game with you because obviously you think, you know, Murray isn't good enough to, to pass up a Caleb Williams. Just how many teams, say if they do end up getting the number one overall pick, how many teams do you think there are that would pass on Caleb Williams, maybe go with someone like Marvin Harrison Jr. or something like that? Oh, man, that's a great question. Um, I mean, you have your definites. Kansas City, we know there's no way there's no quarterback on this earth that they would give up uh, instead of Patrick Mahomes. Cincinnati, I think they would stick with their guy. We saw the Chargers. They just made a commitment to Justin Herbert. Um, mm -hmm. But outside of that, I mean, you're talking about Buffalo is probably another. They wouldn't give away Josh Allen for Caleb Williams. So I would say maybe five or six or so. Um, that will probably say no to Caleb Williams. But after that, I think any other starter in the league probably would be in danger. I think he's that special. Wow, that's unbelievable. But obviously, he's not the only top quarterback in this class. You got Drake May going to the Buccaneers at number three overall. Do you see him as someone who could possibly maybe overtake Williams in the draft? Or do you think this is a clear gap between one and two right now? Yeah, I mean, I'm not going to rule anything out just because there's so many things to play out. And then with Drake, he's another quarterback prospect that I think very highly of what he was able to show in his one year, his first year as a starter uh, in Phil Lago's system. One that I think didn't do him a whole bunch of favors, honestly, but the way he was able to overcome some of the things, especially when Josh Downs was he was kind of banged up throughout the year, missed some games throughout the middle of the season, too. And he was still able to uplift that supporting cast, too. So Drake May, who's a very underrated athlete, very strong arm. Um, I think the best part about his game, though, is just his deep touch and his accuracy. I think he had over 60 passes of 20 plus yards last year, which is a phenomenal number. So some of the things that he's able to do deeper down the field, but he needs to improve in the intermediate and the short areas to get a little bit more decisive. And then he likes to exit the pocket a little bit prematurely at times. So I think that's some of the growth that he has to show going into year two. But he is entering a new system this year under offensive coordinator Chip Lindsey who came over from Central Florida. So I think he's going to get be able to get the ball out a little bit quicker in his offense. And we're going to get to see him right away, uh, what he's made of going against South Carolina, who has some highly touted prospects on their defensive line and then also in their secondary too. So I'm looking forward to seeing how he performs, especially week one. 
Absolutely. You know, I think one of the biggest storylines right now, everyone knows about Caleb Williams. Everyone knows about Drick May. The big storyline, I think, is going to the draft is who is QB3 right now. And you have Quinn Ewers, the quarterback from Texas, going number eight overall uh, to the commanders. Do you think that, you know, obviously he had a kind of an up and down first year at Texas last year, but if he really turns it on, could he join Caleb Williams and Drake May at the top of the draft? Well, does he have the talent without question? I think he's one of the more physically gifted quarterbacks in this draft class, but we're just waiting on him to show it. Mm-hmm. And everything is everything's set up for Quinn Ewers to succeed. He has the a great quarterback teacher in Steve Sarkeesian. We saw what he was able to do at Alabama with Tua Tunga Bailoa and then also Matt Jones. He turned both of those players into first round selections. They're absolutely loaded on the perimeter. Xavier Worthy, Jatavian Sanders. Uh, A.D. Mitchell, you can go on and on about some of these weapons that Texas has, and they have some young guys up front that they like quite a bit that we'll be talking about a lot in 2025. So everything is – the red carpet is rolled out for Quinn Ewers to succeed. So he just has to go out and show it. And he's another player that's going to be tested very early on against Alabama. Uh, I believe that's the first game of the season. So he's going to be able to show it very early on. And he played really well in the first quarter before he suffered that injury that he did last year against Alabama. So if he can just piece everything together, we're talking about a definite first round type of quarterback, but the, the talent definitely has to match the hype. And we haven't seen that so far. I think someone who's a definite first round player, no matter what happens next year, is Marvin Harrison Jr. You have going number two overall to Arizona, getting Caleb and Marvin Harrison Jr. to be unbelievable. That actually does happen. But do you view him as someone who could be the best receiver prospect that we've seen in recent memory over guys like potentially Julio Jones, over guys like Jamar Chase and Mari Cooper? Do you think that he has the capability of being, you know, that high regard? Yeah, without question. If I could bet on one player or one rookie stepping into the league next year or the following season, I should say, and being a pro bowl or all pro type of player, he would get my vote. And in the scouting community, we have a term that's called a statue builder. Mm -hmm. This kid is a statue builder. And what I mean by statue builder is that 20, 25 years from now, we could be talking about him having a statue outside of the stadium of the team that drafts him. I think he's that special of a prospect. He reminds me a lot of A.J. Green when he was coming out of Georgia in the 2011 draft, just fantastic body control, really good hands. And then he makes the easy catches look hard, <laughs> or excuse me, he makes the hard catches look easy, which is something you don't say a lot about a wide receiver prospect. But the way that he's able to move at six foot four, 205 pounds, he's just special. That's, that's the one word that I can use. He doesn't have many weaknesses in his game. If I could add one thing to a skill set, I would like to see him a little bit better, be a little bit better after the catch. I think that's something mm-hmm. that he needs to add to his repertoire. But it's kind of just being really picky with this game just because he's so special in so many different categories. And, man, the fact that he's named after his dad, obviously, who's one of the 10 greatest receivers in NFL history, he's already living up to the hype. I, I don't even want to see what Marvin Harrison III is going to do, honestly, in 15, <laughs> 20 years from now, man. That'd be unbelievable. But, obviously, in the top 10, you have three offensive tackles. I agree with you. I think this offensive tackle class that we have in 2024 could be absolutely special. How would you order and what do you think separates the top three tackles that you have though in Olu Fashano, like you mentioned more earlier, uh, JC Latham from Alabama and uh, Joe Alt from Notre Dame? I think the interesting thing about all three of them, Max, honestly, is that they're completely different types. You have your peer athlete in Olu Fashano who has a very well-rounded game. His balance and body control as a blocker and especially his poise as a pass protector. I think that's something that is so special about his game. And if he would have came out last year, I think he would have firmly went ahead of Paris Johnson Jr., who ended up being six overall to the Arizona Cardinals. So I would be shocked if he's not the first non quarterback selected in this draft class, just because we know every year there's going to be a team that pops up that needs offensive tackle help, especially if they have a young quarterback already in place. So I would be surprised if he gets outside of the top five. I think he's that special of an offensive tackle prospect. And then the second ranked guy for me, which may have caught some people by surprise, is J.C. Latham of Alabama. He's just a road grader, man. He's a fantastic. He's a fantastic run blocker. He's really good as a pass protector. But the thing that I like about him is that he's physical. He's a tone setter and he's one of those dudes that just sets the temperament of your offensive line. He reminds me a lot of Tyler Smith when he was coming out of Tulsa. He needs to clean up the penalties. He had 11 penalties last year. I think Tyler Smith had 16 his final year at Tulsa. But the thing that I say about offensive linemen is that it's one of those positions of where you want to have to tell them to tone it down as opposed to ramp it up. With J.C. Latham, you have to tell him to tone it down just because he has that physical temperament. So I think he's a right tackle only prospect, which makes him a little bit different than Joe Wall and then Olu Fashanu. But if you want to kick him inside the guard, he has experience doing that. He did that during his earlier years at Alabama. So he can play guard. He can play tackle. Very similar to what Tyler Smith is doing with the Cowboys right now. And then Joe Alt, 
he, I'm looking for a big year from Joe Alt just because he he's fluid as a pass protector, but I have some questions about him with his balance. He's a bit of a forward leaner, but you dig up his bio. He was playing tight end three years ago. So you understand why he's a little bit raw at the position, but he's so physically gifted, uh, very long. I think he's about six foot eight, 320 pounds. And he reminds me a lot of Brian O'Neill when he was mm-hmm. coming out of pit, another former a tight end when he was coming out of high school and then coming into pit, just figuring out how to play the position. And then like Marvin Harrison Jr., a player that has fantastic pedigree, I believe his dad was drafted uh, by the Kansas City Chiefs early on. He's in their ring of honor and their Hall of Fame, too. So he has the pedigree that you love to see at the position. Yeah, absolutely. And another guy, I mean, honestly, this, this 2024 class is a ton of blue chip talents. Another guy, I think, is Brock Bowers. You have going 12th overall to the Patriots, which is uh, honestly an unbelievable Bill Belichick pick. I can really see him going all out for this guy with the actual 2024 NFL draft. But do you think that Brock Bowers, I mean, we've seen how amazing he is in his first two years of college football with another dominant junior year. Do you think he could enter that Kyle Pitts-esque territory of, you know, the greatest tight end prospect we've ever seen? I think he's a better prospect than Kyle Pitts. Wow. <laughs> I'll go ahead and say I love I, I that. Yeah, I think he's a better – just because you can do more with him. And if you watch his tape at Georgia, they're using him on jet sweeps. They're throwing him perimeter screens, and then they're giving him some touches out of the backfield. And then he's exceptional after the catch. I think he led the country amongst tight ends and uh, yards after the catch with like 532 yeah. of his total. Like he had over 900 yards receiving last year, so over half of his yards – came after the catch, which is just phenomenal. So he reminds me a lot of George Kittle. Now, he's not Mm -hmm. the blocker that George Kittle was coming out of Iowa. Um, He's more of a, I would say, an absorber as opposed to a displacer. So he's not, you see Kittle just mauling people as the end man of the line of scrimmage. Brock Bowers isn't going to do that on down-to-down basis. But he's going to stand there and survive. Um, He's not going to be embarrassing or anything like that. But uh, he can hold his own as a run blocker. He's just not going to create a lot of displacement or movement like a George Kittle, but as far as in the passing game, I mean, he, he's one of the best tight end prospects that we've ever seen. So obviously we've talked about strictly offensive players in next year's draft, which I think is a loaded offensive class next year, but are there any defensive guys that you maybe give that blue chip label to and guys that you expect to be top five, top 10 picks next year's draft? I don't think we have the blue chip guy, honestly, but there's quite a few that I like quite a bit. Jared Verse of Florida state is one that I'm very high on another like Olu Fashanu, that was a huge surprise to the NFL mm-hmm. scouting community that they came back for another year. He probably would have been a top 10 pick, in my honest opinion. He reminds me a lot of Demarcus Lawrence when he was coming out of Boise State, just a heavy-handed guy. He has hands as heavy as a heavyweight boxer. That's what I wrote on my scouting report about him. Uh, you watch him against Wake Forest. Um, you watch him against Syracuse, him against Matthew Bergeron, who was a second-round pick of the Falcons this past season. He dominated all those guys in the LSU tape. Everybody saw that during the first game of the season. And he's going to have a lot of opportunities to prove that he's worthy of the hype again this year. And it's going to be really hard for him to surpass what he did this year. So I think that's one. Of, that's going to be one of the interesting angles of can he really unlock that next stage of his development just because – He played so well uh, last year. And then another player that I want to mention that I'll probably be a little bit higher on than most people is Kalen King, the cornerback from Penn State. I'm a big fan of him. I actually have him ranked inside of my top 10 players going into the season. He reminds me a lot of Denzel Ward when he was coming out of Ohio State. He doesn't have the length that Kool-Aid McKinstry has, but he has that feistiness about him. And he's kind of like that bug that's just getting on your nerves when you're outside and you're just swatting it away. He has that Jair Alexander, just the agitating corner that can just stay in the hip pocket of a lot of wide receivers. So I'm looking forward to him going up against Marvin Harrison Jr. I think that's going to be a matchup that a lot of people have a star beside this year. Dude, uh, so I actually was lucky enough to talk to him, too. And he mentioned that Marvin Harrison Jr. match. He was like, dude, that is the one thing I'm circling my calendar next year. And, and you mentioned <laughs> that attitude on the field, like – he brought it on the mic too, man. I, we're dropping that interview very soon, but he was saying like, yeah. man, anytime a quarterback throws it my way, I get offended. He's like, I, I get so offended whenever a quarterback throws it my way. So he's got that, you know, CB1 Jalen Ramsey type mentality that I, I absolutely love, man. But speaking of Kalen King, you, you mentioned how he's a guy that you think you're higher on than a lot of other people. When you look at other people's mock drafts, is there another prospect that you look at and say, man, I don't know what they're seeing with this guy. Like, I think this guy is way better than what the consensus is of you of him is. Oh, that's a great question, especially early on. Um, Cameron Kitchens, the safety from Miami, is one that I like quite a bit. I think I had him going middle or early 20s in my my early, way too early first round mock draft. I mean, you talk about outstanding character, um, very involved in the community. The coaches there talk very glowingly about him. And then you look at the player on the field and the tape matches 
everything that you see from a character standpoint and tangibles. He's kind of a throwback, old school, traditional one high free safety. Those mm-hmm. guys don't necessarily go early in the draft. We haven't seen re- one really go super high um, since Malik Hooker. Um, I can't recall the year that Hooker came out, but um, when Hooker was coming out, he was that true traditional center field type of player. And Cameron Kitchens is very similar uh, to Malik Hooker during his time at Ohio State. Um, but my, or excuse me, the um, Georgia Tech game is the one that I think was one of his better games. I believe he had two interceptions in that game. Um, but I'm really looking forward to seeing how he plays this year, too. Yeah, absolutely. And I don't want to get too negative, obviously. But is there a guy maybe that you see in other mock drafts that's going really high? And whenever you scouted him, you're just like, ah, I don't know if I'm going to put him that high, but it's still something I kind of like. Um, Denzel Burt, the Ohio yeah. State corner. Um, I think he's – I didn't see a first-round player when I was watching him. And I think he was banged up quite a bit last year, too. So I want to see him be a little bit more consistent this year. Uh, I think I had an early day three grade going into the year for him, but he still can improve. I'm looking forward to seeing how he plays this year just because Ohio State is loaded on both sides of the ball this year. Yeah, absolutely. And obviously, you know, every year we seem to see guys like Devin Witherspoon come out of nowhere and become a top five pick ultimately in the draft. Do you see a guy that maybe wasn't in your first round, but someone that you studied and said, hey, man, if if he puts it together this year, like I can see this guy launching into the top 10 of the draft probably. Um. Put me on the spot with that one. Um, <laughs> I don't know one name. Well, I will say this. There's one that I like quite a bit. I don't know if he'll launch into the top 10, but maybe mm-hmm. the top 20, and that's Georgia offensive tackle, Marius Mims. He's one that a lot of people are excited about in the scouting community. It's just the sample size is so small with him. He only started two games last year, which were the two games in the college football playoff last year against uh, TCU and then also Ohio State. The Ohio State, he was phenomenal in that game. Um, they suffered some injuries uh, in, at the right tackle spot, and he came in, and there was no drop-off at all. Very athletic, has that same temperament like a J.C. Latham of where he's just trying to embarrass the guy in front of him, especially as a run blocker. And he's just like the big kid on the playground right now that doesn't play with a whole bunch of technique. But he's just so powerful and so so much stronger than everybody out there. He really stands out. So keep an eye on Amarius Mims, the offensive tackle from Georgia. He's one name I think could quickly con- climb up draft boards. Absolutely. And the other question I wanted to ask you, too, is what position, at least for now, do you think is the strongest going into next year's draft? And what position would you say probably the weakest going to next year's draft, too? I think the trenches are really, really strong in this draft class, not necessarily center, um, but I think the guard class is really good offensive tackle. I mean, there's a new name that pops up every single day when I'm studying this class and you're like, man, this guy could be a potential top 50 pick. So I'm really excited about this offensive tackle class. Defensive tackle class is one that I think is exceptional. Mm -hmm. Uh, Jerzon Newton from Illinois is one name that I think a lot of people should have circled. Mason Smith from LSU. He's coming back off of the torn ACL this year. And there's plenty of others. Michael Hall Jr. from Ohio State. I can go on and on about the defensive tackle class. I think it's the best one that we've seen probably since 2019 uh, when Quentin Williams and Jeffrey Simmons and all those guys were coming out. Uh, I think this is the best interior defensive line class that we've seen since that class. And then the edge group, we've already talked about quite a bit. We haven't even mentioned Dallas Turner from Alabama, who a lot of people are excited about. JT Tui Malowal from Ohio State, who I'm very high on. Um, Chuck Robinson from Penn State. So as you can see, I'm just naming all these guys uh, in this defensive line class and then also this offensive stack class to be excited about. Absolutely. And what do you think is the position that maybe at least in preliminary scouting are like, ah, there isn't that top end talent that we see maybe in other years? I would say running back, honestly, just because we were so spoiled with those two guys a year ago and B. John Robinson and Jameer Gibbs. And I wouldn't say it's a down class at running back. I just think we're just waiting for that one guy to emerge. So you're going to see everybody in the industry probably with a different RB1, whether it's Mm -hmm. Travion Henderson from Ohio State, Braylon Allen from Wisconsin, Blake Corum from Michigan, Donovan Edwards from Michigan. There's so many guys that we're waiting to see emerge. We just don't have that consensus top guy or top two like we saw a year ago. Absolutely. So I wanted to ask you a college football question because this is a college football show. And I know you're a big college football fan, too. What is your college football playoff next year and who would be your Heisman pick to again to make a prediction right now? Oh, man. Um, so <laughs> I'm actually a Florida State fan. I was a big Florida State fan growing up. So, dude, I'm all that's my sleeper. That, that's my sleeper team. <laughs> um, I'm, a, I'm a big I'm a big seminal guy. So I'm hoping Florida State gets in this year. But if I had. To put money on it, if I was a betting man, which I'm not, my four teams um, that I would put in my college football playoff right now would be 
Georgia, I mean, you have to put them in there, even though we're waiting to see what Carson Beck do, does this year. He has huge shoes to fill with Stetson Bennett gone. Michigan, who is absolutely loaded on both sides of the ball this year. They have a lot of guys coming back, too. Those next two spots are really up for grabs, honestly. But I'm going to kind of go off the grid right here. So I'm going to say Florida State is one. And then a huge sleeper, hopefully they don't let me down this year, is Washington. I think Washington may have a chance to sneak in this year with that high-powered offense. I think they're going to put up a lot of numbers with Michael Penix Jr. slinging it. And then Rome Odunze, who a lot of people were excited about in the scouting community, too. And then they have some intriguing pieces on defense, too. Defensive end Braylon Trice, another one of those defensive ends who I didn't even mention earlier that a lot of people are excited about, too. So I'm going to go with those four. A little bit different with those last two teams. Dude, honestly, we have three out of four. I, I have Florida State, I have Georgia, I have Michigan. I, I put USC in there, too. So I think Caleb Williams is going to will that team to the playoff uh, this upcoming year. But what about the Heisman? Do you think Caleb is going to ultimately go back to back in the Heisman, or do you think someone else is going to take it? I mean, there's always somebody that comes out of nowhere every single year. Um, I don't have a particular pick as far as who that guy is. Maybe it's a, a Michael Penix. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a Quinn Ewers. Um, maybe it's Caleb does win it again. But I'm looking forward to seeing what happens this year. Maybe it's Jordan Travis from Florida State. There's so many different um, players that possibly could be in the running for it. But I'm looking forward to see how it all unfolds. Absolutely. Man. Actually, I picked Jordan Travis to win the Heisman this year. I think your Seminoles, man, are, they're, they're a house this year, man. They're loaded on both sides of the ball. But Jordan, the last question I want to ask you, man, a lot of people look at you right now as an ESPN NFL draft analyst. Go, man, that is my dream job. That's where I want to be. What advice would you give those people who are trying to get into the industry like you? Oh, that's a great question. Um, something that I made sure to do was just figure out what your niche is and just figure out what your angle is, whether it's radio, whether it's TV, um, whether it's podcasting, whether it's writing, whether it's a combination of all of them. Just figure out what your niche is and then just go with it. Don't be scared to be versatile. Everybody's going to have weaknesses or areas that they don't feel good about or strong points, especially in the media sphere. Find out what you're strong at, attack it, and then also find out what you're weak at and go for it as well. Just figure out um, what you do well and then just always have versatility, always be open to anything that you do, and then just have fun with it. You never know when your blessing or your opportunity is going to come. That's what happened with me when I got the call from ESPN, but hard work and then work ethic always gets discovered. That's what I tell everybody, and then just figure out how you're different in this space just because there's so many things that are similar in this space. So just figure out how you fit in, but also how you can be different in the media space too. Jordan, I was a huge fan of yours, the draft network. Now my colleague, Trevor Sikama, now you're killing ESPN, <laughs> man. This is an awesome interview, Jordan. I really appreciate you taking time out, man. Thank you, Max. Thanks for having me.